Today we are looking at repairing a Marshall JMP1. The customer has described the fault as poor cleans. Hopefully, by the end of this video, we'll see how to correlate that customer description with the actual fault. We may need to go through the schematics together to have a better understanding of this rather complicated uh, piece of equipment from the early 90s. It's probably 30 years old. If this sounds like something you might be of interest, go grab yourself a coffee and uh, pull up your chair and um, look over my shoulder and we'll get started. <laughs> Oh, hi, I'm Chris, the guitar amp tech from Sydney, Australia. The musician who owns this amp has reported the sound as being poor cleans. I had a quick look in the history of the JMP1. It was quite a deviation from the traditional amplifiers that made Fent Marshall famous. It has two 12x7 preamp tubes, but it would be stretched to call this anything other than a solid state preamp. I have to chuckle actually when I read about the descriptions of being like classic overdrive from the super lead plexi to the molten gold of a glassy edge JTM 45. By the time your signal sees that first tube, it has already gone through three op amp stages and the drive channel is just clipped by a network of diodes. That's not to say that the JMP1 sounds bad, it doesn't, it sounds good. And it's very versatile with its MIDI and all that, but it seems misleading to compare it to those great Marshall amps of old. I'll show you what I mean. Let's take a quick look at the first few stages of the dirty and clean channels and how Marshall handles this hybrid signal chain. It's a pretty complicated circuit as you can see, very neat and tidy I must admit. It's one of the better PCB layouts I've seen, but pretty complicated. So let's have a look at the schematic and see if we can make any more sense out of that. Here's our input signal coming in here, splits between these two op amp stages. They're both uh, in the one package. And uh, a unique thing about the 5201 is that there is a pin where you can select this op amp or this op amp. So you're selecting one or the other internal to the chip. So this one is a non-inverting input and you can see the gain here, which is basically this divided by this plus one. So um, you can figure that out. What's that about uh, six, five and a bit? Or you can go this way where we've got a 56K divided by a 27k so it's a gain of about two and interesting little thing that they've got happening here where that can that itself can also be adjusted by this FET here which is basically switching in a different uh, capacitor and resistor so it'll change gain and sound a little so anyway the signal goes to one of these two then comes back into here goes through a control, a volume control, and into this op amp here. Now this is operating as unity gain, as you can see there. Output of this, that's just acting as a buffer. In here, around that volume control. And then out there, that's the clean signal out. And we're gonna just pursue that one next. So this is where that was taken off. And this is where it comes into its first tube stage. So it's gone through uh, two or three um, solid state um, op amp stages first, then comes through this gain stage, uh, this tube gain stage. It looks pretty conventional, 100K and 1.5K, pretty standard Fender um, type of uh, biasing arrangement on this tube. Comes out of there into this uh, tone modifying stage. Once again, also selectable here to change it a bit more. Then it goes into our second tube stage. We have here a dividing point where the signal will either go to the clean channel that we just looked at, 
all comes straight through here where it's going to go into the drive channel. There's a buffer stage here, then goes into an inverting gain stage. And this is super high gain. Look at this. It's got one meg divided by 5k, which is going to give us a gain of about 200. That's a huge whack of gain. Why so big? Because they want a nice large signal to go into this clipping phase here. And pretty unusual, actually, instead of just being a diode or a couple of diodes, they've got a bridge rectifier, basically. So the positive part of the signal is going to come through here into the, in the die network. It's going to go this way, then out this leg. So it's gone through one diode. Oh, this one's positive advice, so it'll go that way as well. So that's two diodes up through here, three diodes, and then back out. When it's the negative part of the signal, it's going to go around this diode again, but this time the other way around. And up this way, this is the negative signal. And you'll go there. So both positive and negative will have gone through three diode stages. And then we go into our first tube in the gain stage. Well, this is more of a conventional Marshall type of um, biasing arrangement through this tube out here and then into that tube. Here's our power supply. And the uh, primary of the power supply has got two 120 volt taps, which if they put in parallel, it's 120. If they put them in series, it'll be 240. So. It's obviously, there's this little link network, it's probably on the PCB, um, that uh, enables you to select it, and obviously here it's been selected for 240. Then we have uh, two taps here, we have a 0, 15, 0, and that is going through this bridge rectifier, and then it's going to go through a 15 volt regulator and out there down here we've got lt low tension what do we got here 7805 here's where we're getting the heaters from for the tube so it's 12 volt unregulated um, but it has been converted to dc through this rectifier here so we'll check to see that that's okay and here's our high tension this will be going to the plate of the two uh, 12ax7s we've got a bridge rectifier here some filtration here so 10 microfarad at 350 a dropping resistor and another 10 so this is called a pi circuit pretty good filtration um, probably could have done with slightly higher capacitor values but in all honesty, a 12 x 7 is going to draw two tenths of bugger all. And then that goes out to a high tension. So we'll be checking that as well. It doesn't tell us what the voltage of that is, but I'd be thinking we'd be looking at somewhere between uh, 200 to maybe 300, two, two 300 volts DC I'd expect to see on that. Let's bring that amplifier back and start doing some measurements. Let's check some voltages. We're powered up. We're going through the current limiter. Okay, plus or minus 15 are okay. Plus five is okay. So let's have a look at our B plus. We can check it there at the rectifier, or we can check it straight on the tube. And that'll be on pin one. Eleven volts. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's our other plate. Okay, that's a bit odd. What's the other tube doing? Also low. All right. Let's have a look at this rectifier here. It has a HT. All right, let's just do a diode check on these rectifier diodes. Looking very much like we have got a cooked power transformer. 
and I bet you anything this is going to be a challenge to find, certainly in Australia. The amp is 30 years old and um, I suspect the support for something like this is not going to be great. But <clears throat> next thing we've got to do is we've got to figure out how to pull that transformer out. Well, removing that circuit board is a disgrace. Every single thing had to come out to enable its removal. Shame on you, Marshall, for designing like this. Yes, sure, it's cheap to just clip in a PCB by just clipping on these little standoffs. Good luck trying to compress those standoffs to release the circuit board. It's just painful. In the end, I ended up, you, know, you probably recognise these, recognize these as wall plugs. Go mooching through, find something which is small enough to just push down on it and press in the prong. Uh, you know, it took me probably, you know, with all of the swearing in between, probably a good couple of hours just to get to this point. Yeah, until I came up with my little prong suppression system. Anyway, on with um, desoldering this transformer. I want to pop him out, test him out a circuit, and then try and find a replacement. I'm back. It only took about three weeks, but I'm back. So this transformer, major pain in the ass. You can't get one. Marshall Distributor in Australia hasn't got it. Marshall, according to them, overseas doesn't have it. I couldn't find it online anywhere. I found uh, Mercury Magnetics have one. Quite expensive. Uh, and by the time you get it out to Australia, it's even more expensive again. So, And uh, shipments from the States are just ridiculous now. At the tail end of COVID, we're just... I think the last thing I heard is USPS have held up deliveries to Australia, just not doing any. So I took it to my um, ever faithful, ever reliable transformer rewinding person, thinking he's not going to be able to do that because it's really low profile, really small, really ridiculous, just to make it fit really, Marshall. Anyway, I've put it back in and um, now comes the challenge. I have to reassemble this back in the chassis just to turn it on. You know what? Maybe I can reassemble it all on the bench without putting it in the chassis first. If it all works first time, I'll be very happy and very surprised. I'm going a bit overboard on protection here because it's the first time I'm powering up with the transformer. So I'm going into my current limiter. I've set it to limit. So we're going through the bulb limiter. Um, when I want to go uh, bypass the limiter and just go full current, I'll flick it down and then we go through my little amp meter. But now it'll just be on that uh, globe. So we hope that's gonna not light up at all. And uh, then I've got the current limiter being fed by the Variac. So I'm going to bring this voltage up nice and slow. Pin one, this is the plate of one of them. 73 volts there. 75 volts there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Should be another one. 74, nine, eight, seven, six. Oops, 9876, 75, okay. We're heading north, let's keep going. It's 64 volts AC at the input. My plate's now at 95, 235 on the plate. It's looking positive. Let me just check the regulators again. Minus 15. This should be a plus 15, plus 15. This should be 7805, should be a plus five. Perfect. 7805, another one, so there should be another plus five. Perfect, okay. So I'm feeling pretty positive about this. 
I'm going to go up to 240. Okay, 240 volts. We've got 276, 280. I'm pretty sure they'll be right, but I'm just going to check them again. Yep, okay, they're fine. All right, so now I'm going to switch it off current limiter and just give it full current. We're drawing 0.05 amps, 50 milliamps. And our tubes, of course, aren't drawing anything because they're not plugged in. Okay, all looking good. I'm now going to turn it off. Okay, we're looking pretty good. Um, let's power it back up now and have a look at the indicators. Hopefully they're all operating. Okay, I'm liking the look at that. I've got no idea how to operate this, so let's just press some buttons and see if it does anything. Oh, see a number changing. Oh, look at that. Got no idea if this is making any sense. <laughs> I've got no idea how that works. How do you change volume when you're just pressing a button? Oh, I don't know. I wonder if it's got something to do with this. No. Anyway, I'm confident enough that I should now plug the output of this into my power amp. Huh? Power amp, you say? As the JMP1 is a preamp, I'm going to take the output of that and plug it into my deluxe reverb. Um, I'll use the pad to get a lower output because I'll be plugging it into the uh, input jack. There's no um, send return jack on this. This is my deluxe reverb tone master. I know that sounds a bit heretic, heretical, heretical for a amp repairer. <laughs> To use an amp which is unrepairable but it, it's great i turn it on there off about 20 times a day uh, i wouldn't do that with a real one now before i plug it into my amplifier i'm just going to check the output of the jmp1 to make sure there's no dc on it because i don't want to damage my amplifier okay zero volts good i'm happy about that Connect that back up to there. All right, here goes nothing. And now I'm going to plug the guitar into that. Let's have a look. Oh, God. How do you get a clean sound out of this thing? All right. Well, I suppose Marshall these days calls that clean. Yeah, if you say so, Marshall. It's clean too. It's clean one. Well, look, I think I'm confident that I can put this back together. Well, not the usual ending to a repair video. We couldn't do that audition at the end for you to hear how it sounded. Uh, the customer was keen to get his amp back, so he picked it up before I could uh, film that. So what did I think of the JMP one? Well, all I'm going to say is it's, it, maybe it's an age thing. I, I love the sound of tubes. There's just something about them, which I'm yet to hear reproduced by any form of solid state. Even um, I bought a uh, deluxe reverb uh, tone master after doing my comparison. Yeah, I love it. I turn my amp on and off in the workshop 20 times a day. 
I wouldn't treat a, a vintage deluxe reverb like that. So for my purposes, it's great. I reckon for a gigging museo, it's great. But um, there's just doesn't have that tube sound. And even though that JMP1 had two preamp tubes in it, I reckon they were token. The vast majority of that uh, signal path is going through solid state. Even the, the distortion is done through clipping diodes. So um, what did I think of it? Not my cup of tea. You're at a gig, you want to turn your volume up, you reach over and you, you just flick the dial. Can't do that on a JMP one. You've got to press the volume button, then turn the, the data knob. Treble, bass, nah, it, it's not for me. I'm glad my customer loves it though. I'm looking forward to seeing it at the next video. Ooh, I think it might be a nice one too. We've got an old Ampex, see if I can get that up on the bench next for you. Until then, bye for now.